So the presentation is called Fermenting Workplace Democracy, how local pickle makers, chocolate makers, and brewers are using a cooperative model to transform our food industry. So this panel is gonna be exploring how three local companies are using worker ownership and fermentation to change our food industry for the better. We'll also learn about how these worker cooperatives are succeeding at scale and explore the bubbly intersection of fermentation and workplace democracy. So our panelists, for today will be uh, these four beautiful pickles sitting next to me. Uh, we've got Lucy Khan of Real Pickles, which is a worker-owned cooperative in Western Mass that produces raw fermented vegetables. And we've got Danielle Robideau of Equal Exchange, which is a worker-owned cooperative in East Bridgewater that sells fair trade coffee, chocolate, and tea. James Raza, of Democracy Brewing, <laughs> it's hard for the bad timing, uh, of Democracy <laughs> Brewing, a worker-owned brewery and restaurant right in downtown Boston. And finally, Greg Brodsky, our moderator, who's the founder of Start.coop, a Boston-based accelerator who cooperatively owned businesses. So with that, I'm gonna let them take it away. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Hi, everyone, welcome. Um, did everyone get enough samples? Oh, yeah. uh, we've got a lot of yummy samples, so feel free to help yourself. Um, you guys are very fortunate to have this amazing selection of uh, palettes and samples today. Um, what I do is I work with entrepreneurs who want to create cooperative owned businesses. So we run a small accelerator program, we take a handful of entrepreneurs a year, and we help them to scale up their businesses. Um, what we have today is, is very exciting, is we have three cooperatively owned businesses at scale, and they're three amazing local companies. When I, when I talk to people about the word cooperative, it's always an interesting question. You know, how many people have heard of it? How many people really get it? So I'm just curious, just by show of hands, how many of you have heard the word co-op? Great, so basically everyone, so how many of you feel like you could accurately define what a worker co-op is? Again, show of hands. <laughs> so, really, really interesting, right? So we, we've all heard the word, but not everyone knows what it is. And, and there's actually some data that supports this around 76% of people would actually rather support a cooperative loan business, but only 10% of people can really define what it is. So there's this gap between sort of the halo effect, we love co-ops, we want more of them, we want to support them, <coughs> what the hell is it, right? So today we're gonna dive a little bit more into what they really are, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a better sense of how three local <coughs> companies are doing it. Um, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to uh, just explain a little bit more about their organization and their role, and then we'll dive into uh, what it really means to them to be a working co-op. So uh, first, Lucy, um, just your you know, name, role, and, and what you guys do. Sure, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm Lucy uh, at Real Pickles. I wear a couple of different hats. Um, in my day-to-day -day work, I'm a sales rep. I'm also on our board of directors. I've been a worker owner uh, for about two and a half years, coming up on three, um, and I serve as treasurer and on some different committees. Um, so Real Pickles is uh, based in Greenfield, Massachusetts. We've been around since 2001. That was when we started fermenting organic vegetables grown uh, mainly in Western Mass and Southern Vermont. And we also source produce from the whole Northeast region. Um, our mission is really to promote human <coughs> and ecological health through making nourishing organic fermented foods. Um, and we're an example of a business that converted to being a worker co-op. Um, so we became a co-op in 2012 and 13. I can talk more about our process and what our business looks like now. I'll pass it down. Great. Um, my name is Danielle Robido. I work at Equal Exchange, and I'm a worker owner. I've also been at Equal Exchange for three and a half years. I'm an organizer, which means that I also wear a lot of hats. I think that's um, common when you talk to folks who work at cooperatives. They're often doing a lot of different things. So um, Equal Exchange is an organic food company. We sell coffee, chocolate, tea, avocados, bananas, um, and dried nuts. So you could probably see us in a lot of food cooperatives. You've probably seen our logo. It's the two arrows, red and white, pointing to one another as an Equal Exchange. Um, we are one of the largest alternative trade organizations in the world, one of the largest worker-owned cooperatives in the US. And uh, we started basically um, in support of um, solidarity with Nicaragua during the Reagan administration in the 80s. And so um, po political, so basically um, we've had political roots since the beginning. And so 
we decided, okay, we want to support um, democratic cooperatives abroad. And so we said, hey, why don't, why don't we organize ourselves as a worker co-op if we're going to have those expectations of other folks? And so that's been a 30 year process. It's like maybe some folks joke that it's maybe just starting to be functional. And um, so my role um, 30 years later is basically to kind of um, go back to those models and we kind of use the, a three-legged stool as a way to like kind of picture all parts of our supply chain, which are our farmers, our worker owners, and our customers. And so I organize an initiative of 4,000 activists across the United States. And basically, they, it's, the idea is to invite them more deeply into our network. So we're organizing consumers um, democratically. Basically, the idea is that uh, equal exchange really came from like the conscious consumerism movement. And that's like why we have grown to scale is because folks like who are sitting in the audience have bought our products. And so basically, we don't believe that you can create change by bu just buying anymore. So it's our attempt to basically push folks to go beyond buying and go beyond your dollars. Uh, my name is James Raza. I'm one of the founders of Democracy Brewing. Um, we're a worker-owned, well, worker cooperative brewery. Usually I have to explain that all at the beginning, but everybody seems real good, sorry. So, uh, so uh, we're a worker cooperative brewery. Uh, we just had our one year anniversary about a month ago. Um, we make everything in house. We're a few blocks that way in downtown Crossing. Um, make all the beer in the house. We also make all the food from scratch. So even like the uh, uh, the buns are baked fresh every day, that kind of stuff. So everything's made from scratch. Uh, we have about 31 workers. Um, we have a $15 an hour start. Um, everybody after one year can become an owner. Um, so we just had our one year anniversary. So now we have 11 owners. Um, and you're going to start seeing it more like so. I'm hoping even in the next six months will be more than half work around. Um, and we do everything from, I mean, I guess the real heart of what we wanted to do too was our community outreach was the public house. Uh, 30 years ago, oh, not 30 years ago, a long time ago, hundreds of years ago, even in places like Ireland, the public house was the main place that wasn't a church and wasn't your home. It was a place that you could come together, hear music, have a beer, eat some food, but more importantly, build community. Um, in the Irish context, that often meant full revolution, but. Uh, <laughs> But here in America, too, it was a very, very important thing. And then you saw sort of unions come around, and that started to be where people gathered and congregated and solved problems, as well as progressive churches, things like that. But in New England, those things have all started to really die out. Um, and there's less and less places to build community. And so for us, a big chunk of, a, of that was trying to actually do that in downtown Boston. Um, in some ways, I think we've been successful, we're still working on it. I mean, you see comedy, food, stuff like that, and you know, we have live music all the time and do all sorts of fun events, but I think a big chunk of it too is that like frequently we'll do things for worker solidarity. So like when Unikea went out on strike, um, you know, we were trying to every week give them beer and food and just like help them out because it's lonely out there, especially in February. Um, so anyways, we do a lot of stuff like that, even doing stuff like, you know, for every beer you come in, depending on what kind of beer it is, on what, like, I'll give you a real concrete thing. In September, we're doing stuff for the American Cancer Society. So every time you drink one of those beers, dollar goes towards that, but it's like sometimes raising awareness, sometimes just helping folks out. We also are kind of involved with organizing stuff where we just kind of donate our space for people who are doing really good organizing work, like the Sunrise Movement on climate change, things like that. We'll keep working with them just because it's important. So, so that's the, the big part of it. So I imagine a lot of you have questions. I want to just let you know in advance, we're going to save at least 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end. Um, and uh, I want to ask everyone a little bit more detail now about you know, what being a worker co-op really means for each of your organizations. I should have a little bit of context that when we say the word cooperative, um, it's not always a worker co-op. So when I say cooperative, I mean a shared ownership model. So we all know sort of a traditional ownership model that maybe has investors on one side, maybe the people supporting the business on the other side, um, and we kind of know how that goes in our, in our current system. Uh, cooperatives say, look, the people who are supporting the business should actually have a share in that business. Um, and, uh, and work cops are one very specific type that you know, does a lot of amazing things. So for each of you now, you know, in, in as basic terms as you can, um, try to give folks, you know, what does that really mean for each of you to be a worker co-op? Yeah, so I would say that like, the heart of it for us is that being a worker-owned business means when you co-own the business with, with us, 
you're sharing the profit and sharing the risk in the business, and you're helping make decisions that guide that business. Um, so similarly to Democracy Brewing, after one year, people can join Real Pickles. Um, and we mentor people through that process, and we have staff classes in the year uh, that, we have staff classes that repeat every year, so that um, people who are like arriving at their one year anniversary are really prepared, like have a sense of what the balance sheet looks like, and uh, understand our mission, and why we have a business structure the way we do to create change in the food system. So we mentor people through that process of becoming owners. That's really key, like training people and uh, really communicating like the mission and the story of ownership. Um, and uh, then during each year that you work, you are allocated a share of the profits proportional to the number of hours you work in the co-op. Um, so that's called patronage, and that's what I mean by shared profit. We're literally uh, sharing the profit of the business instead of that profit being concentrated in one owner. It's spread over 13 in our co-op. We're at 13 owners right now. Um, and then, you know, shared risk is uh, the decisions that we make guiding the business have consequences. And, um, you know, potentially in the event of a year where there's negative net income in the business, the worker owners together are gonna figure out what to do about that and possibly like allocate that risk. Um, we've never had to do that in our co-op yet, but it's something that's important to talk about. That's the other side of shared profit, right? Um, and when I talk about making decisions together, um, we do all our decision making by consensus. And um, without getting too into the nitty gritty, I'll say that all of the worker owners get a vote of who joins the board of directors, and we have a nine-person board of directors. That board is meeting once a month at the end of the workday to talk about uh, you know, our, our long-term strategy, our vision. That board of worker owners crafts our mission statement, and that board of directors is all worker owners. Um, we don't have outside stakeholders on that board. That's what works best for us. Um, so that's where the decision making happens. It happens uh, you know, at the membership level and the board of directors level. And we also have a typical management structure with you know, a general manager and a sales manager and a production manager. So not, you know, not all the worker owners are coming to consensus about like, whether or not we hang a piece of art in the lobby. Right? We still have like, some delegation and uh, you know, clear roles within that decision making structure. And I'll pass it. Great. I'm glad you just gave that really thorough explanation because Equal Exchange is uh, actually structured really similarly. So we have a year uh, worker owner track, and so after a year, folks are voted in. We also share patronage. Um, one of the unique models that we have that um, may or may not be a little bit different, I'm not sure if you have investors, but we still do have investors, but it's a bit different where the investors do get a dividend, um, but it's actually, they have given up control, so they have no say in our business at all. So the control lies equally within the board and the worker owners. Uh, the board is made up as a majority of worker owners, also nine and three outside board directors. And so we're in the midst of kind of um, reevaluating that structure right now. So um, really trying to bring in consumers in a different way. So we may expand that so that actually the three outside board directors that are now um, by the worker owners potentially will be voted on um, by that group. So it's actually really meaningful to give up that power and control to some portion of your board, but still we have the majority of worker owners who are controlling everything. But yeah, similar, it's like, you know, a year and you take classes, there's a mentor program. So like, what the heck is this worker owner thing? You know, you might feel a bit lost. You know, when I first started Equal Exchange, I really liked fair trade coffee and kind of came into it from the con conscious consumerism side, but I had no idea what it meant to work for a worker co-op, and it's actually really different. And just to kind of build on some of the things that Lucy had said, because I won't bore you with the structure because it's a bit similar, so I don't want to reiterate it, but it's really just like when I go to work every day, I, it does feel like I'm wor I work for a company, like there's still, you know, those basic things that you need to do, but there you want to turn the light off when you leave. Like there's... Uh, there, the biggest difference for me, because I, I did work for some kind of more mainstream corporations before, is like my voice matters, right? Like when I go to work, like I, I can say what I believe, and that's because there's a shared responsibility and shared ownership. And so I wouldn't, I could, don't think I could ever go back to like a traditional company. This point, Equal Exchange has maybe ruined that for me, but um, it's, it definitely feels different when you go to work for sure. 
Um, so honestly, we've covered a ton of the stuff that I would also say. So we have a pretty traditional structure. I mean, I guess I'll just say, that I, so I used to work in English Exchange like five years ago for about a year and a half. And I worked with another co-op before that. For like, we're actually in the US Federation Work Cooperatives as like an intern. So I got to observe a bunch of different ones. And one of the ones that I found the most inspiring was actually the, the Ares Menu Association. Um, they started off as one bakery, and then they, they created like five or six, basically based on the same thing, franchising them. So off topic, but we're hoping to do the same thing in a certain way. But what was really interesting about the Ares Menu Association was is that they would basically hire everybody as an employee, and it'd be a totally traditional company, where they would just be like, no, nope, you need to be here at this time, and they'd run it like a total, and that year they would train everybody how to actually run a business and how to be democratic. Because nothing in our society, for the most part, prepares people to work democratically. So we're a very traditionally structured thing right now, and we're starting to devolve into more and more democracy. And that was what a lot of folks who I really trusted who've been around a lot smarter than me, was sort of like, let it evolve. If you try to force it and people don't understand it, it's not only disempowering because they don't understand it, it's also just like creates chaos. So the stuff that we're doing right now as owners, like I'd say the biggest thing for me that it was amazing to see and why I would never want to start a business to another way was just the ownership that came before people were even owners. But we had people come in on their day off and deep clean the bathrooms wow. because they said they needed them. Wow. Like, holy God. Um, <laughs> so there was things like that that just kept happening though that just blew my mind. Like, you know what we should do to make more money, you know, and just like people kept coming up with different ideas. One of the things we also do is open book management. Well, that's not sure if we're working on starting to create that. So we're taking classes as managers and then we're gonna be trying to instill that into our other workers and working with a group called We Think Restaurants to actually train people in open book management. And the idea behind that really is, is that the first person who understands if you know your portions are too big are the dishwasher. But if no one's asking the dishwasher, right? Because every time he gets a chocolate cake and half of it's still there, yeah. and he scrapes it, but he doesn't think about it. He has no skin in the game in most businesses, right? So for us, he does have skin in the game. If he does find out ways he can be more productive, he's actually going to make more profit. And that also means we need to have feedback loops, though, where people are actually t having space to talk, right? So we're doing stuff now, the last couple months, like we're doing bi-monthly um, problem solver meetings. Part of it was because, frankly, businesses are very top-down, traditionally, and it becomes almost paternalistic. Where people come to you like, you know, Dad, will you fix this thing? And it's like, well, what do you want me to do? They're like, oh, I don't know how to fix it. And it's like, well, if you don't know how to fix it, and I don't know how to fix it, it's not a problem, right? It's just a thing that we do at work that sucks, and it's part of our job. So this was more just trying to make it so we're actually meeting together and problem solving together. And that's the sort of direct democracy to us that makes more sense in certain ways too. Where it's like, this is my job and this is what you can do to make it better. And like, that makes sense. Or like, that doesn't make sense, let's uh, talk about it and you meet in the middle, right? Um, we also have the same thing that we have a board. Um, so we're going through our first real board. Before that, I was the CEO and president. So basically a dictator. Um, <laughs> so now I'm stepping down as president, the joke around is that I'm going to be fired very soon. Um, I'm assuming they're joking. We'll find out. Um, anyways, so the idea is, is that uh, so we're going to be going through that. We've been already taking classes. Um, we also have a lot of folks who are Spanish speaking too, so we're doing special classes for them in Spanish. Um, I mean, they speak English too, but it's like if you're going to be talking about complicated business stuff, it's better to have it. That language that you feel most comfortable. So we're doing all that stuff, and hopefully in like a month from now, we'll have a totally new elected board. I'll step down, and they'll start having us do sort of big long-term year, two-year strategic planning together. But then we'll continue to have this sort of bottom-up following up democracy about what do we do on the day-to-day -day stuff too. Great, so a few themes I just wanna, um, and feel free to jump in on So what I'm hearing from you guys is, um, that while people are more invested um, and there's there's a board for each of you, not everything is being decided by consensus. Is that fair? And I just want to clarify that because I think science people think work across me and every little thing is being decided. Maybe you want to explain a little bit more? I'll, I'll start by clarifying something for Real Pickles, that there are places where the whole kitchen crew coming to agreement about a system is exactly the kind of buy-in. That's, like, that's what it looks like at Real Pickles. That's what that kind of direct democracy looks like for us. And so even though there's a manager who might be, you know, bottom line responsible for food safety in the kitchen, it's really important for everyone to be bought into that system. And so even though that's not fully, a, it's not a worker owner consensus decision, because there's worker owners and non-worker owners who work in the kitchen, but part of, I think for us, part of the spirit of being a co-op is still approaching those problem solving meetings in a way where we want to hear everybody's voice and get everybody 
bought into a system in a way that they agree with. Um, so it, in the room, sometimes it feels like consensus. It feels like, wait, does anyone have a better idea? Is everybody ready to do this? OK, no blocks, let's go. <laughs> So that's really interesting. So there, there is a technical hierarchy, but you're trying to reach consensus as much as possible. Is that yeah. fair to say? Yeah, it's really definitely. interesting. Um, and you know, the I think that training also comes because the people running those meetings are used to the board meetings and the member meetings and the other places in the business where we use consensus. And so that uh, that spirit of like involvement and like the importance of of people's voice and people's People being their whole selves, people being their whole selves at work really trickles down to all parts of the business. Danielle, you guys are a much yeah. bigger organization, so I'm just curious yeah. to hear how, what that would, you know, 13 so, people versus 120 people, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, so we actually have about 130 worker owners, and I literally nothing would get done if everyone had to agree on everything. <laughs> and we actually uh, disagree a lot, there's a lot of tension, and I think that's what folks, you know, it's easier. I think once when Equal Change started, it was more collaborative. They had the shared vision because, you know, really everyone's like a founder. And so they're all, and you still have like that connection to mi mission as you get larger. But I think it becomes more complicated. So I'd say we have like different committees and those all work by consensus pretty much. And so, you know, I'm on a leadership and training committee where basically we're trying to um, get folks to feel more confident and that they have leadership skills to be able to run for our board so we have more competitive elections because we believe that is, is positive, that's healthy. And so I think that that's a lot of things that I think folks don't talk about as you have bigger. You really need to stay connected to your mission and why are we here and like always kind of coming back to that. But also that democracy requires trust. It's like representative, you know, I thought long and hard about do I want to run for the board? Who is running for the board? I'm going to vote for them and I'm going to encourage and empower them to make decisions that I, you, you, we couldn't just make every decision. It just wouldn't be possible. We have people on the production line. We have folks, you know, ab abroad who are working with producer relations. We have folks in grocery retail that ha are, you know, in that space. So there's, there's too many different areas and so we definitely don't work on a consensus but there are different teams and typically those work on consensus one of the really innovative things that I think equal exchange does is we have a really unique hiring process and includes all sorts of weird stuff like role plays and whatever but um, the hiring is always by consensus and we're like really um, committed to that model and stringent on that so all right, so I want to ask you guys, we're going to shift a little bit. That was a lot of heavy governance, but room for questions that people want to ask about it. Uh, let's mix up a little bit. So when we're at a fermentation festival, and one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys is, you know, do you think there's a, a connection between workplace democracy, which we're all doing amazing at, and, and fermentation? Is there, is there something bubbling in the air that connects the two that is similar in spirit of why you're in the space, or is it just random that you're on this panel? Is that however you'd like? James, yeah, we'll we it up? Yeah. <laughs> well, mine's a quick answer. Uh, so we have 31 employees, and we have one person who works in the brewery. So it's like the least democratic part of our business is the fact of fermentation. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah, I think, so I had really like struggled with this question, to be honest with you. And I don't know if I'm getting too heady, but I, I don't know, fermentation to me, it, requires a lot of attention to detail and really connecting with your food and basically this kind of constant process of renewal. You know, if you don't constantly think about innovating yourself and kind of pushing yourself to your edge, then, you know, I think you can't really continue to grow and you, to be competitive in a corporately dominated space as a worker co-op, you have to constantly be thinking about what's the next thing, black box item. and. So I don't know if that's too far of a stretch, but I mean, you know, all of our products undergo, you know, fermentation with the coffee and chocolate, and so that happens really, you know, on the farm level. So that is really like deep relationships with all the folks that are making visits to our producer partners every week, basically. So I don't. That's my best guess, but maybe. Um, <laughs> more yeah. Close to it is pickles, right? Like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a couple of things that uh, 
bubbled up, no pun intended. <laughs> um, the first one is decentralization, like fermentation, uh, you know, really is, when we're talking about vegetable fermentation, like making sauerkraut really began at the level of the household or the level of the kitchen. And, um, you know, working from an economy where power and wealth are consolidated to one where power is shared and wealth is shared and where, uh, you know, control is decentralized, that mirrors the fermentation process in terms of what the technology of fermentation allows a food system to do. And then the other, um, other similarity I would draw out is that both of these things are really old. <laughs> People have been collaborating with microbes for a long time, and people have been cooperating with each other for a long time. And sometimes people call co-ops or this, this new wave of worker ownership and workplace democracy the new economy. And I get that. There's a lot of really amazing work that deserves to be recognized as new in terms of our lifetimes and our you know, current economic system. But really, these traditions are really old. And the values that are guiding the, the spirit of cooperation are, you know, predate capitalism on this planet. And I think it's important to remember that. Uh, and of course, you know, what co-ops look like in our current economy are going to be a little bit different. But, uh, but I really feel that through line. Uh, that's important for me. Can I work? Um, how has being a worker-owned co-op uh, helped you guys, in, in, either internally with your employees, or and you already mentioned a few examples, but you know, or externally in terms of getting your message out and your branding. Uh, I would say for us, um, I'd say for us, the restaurant industry in particular, we were just chatting about that too. It was one of the most abusive industries, period. Mm -hmm. It has some of the most sexual That's harassment. Yeah. It's the only time I've seen slavery in America, uh, where in not this Chinatown in San Francisco. So I was doing restaurant organizing there. Uh, my background is community labor organizing, mm -hmm. and. Um, they had, the, you know, basically the same thing where they brought in immigrants illegally, then they had them working off their debt, you know, 18 hours a day and sleeping on the tables. So it's a competitive industry too. So like that's, you know, there's a lot of those kind of abuses going, and then we're trying to same hit that same profit point, or I just say the same price point, and then on top of that, pay $15 an hour. So for us, the advantage I think was creating work. The one thing we haven't talked too much about, or I should say I haven't, is that our biggest thing we're trying to really work on is culture. Um, I've worked in democratic businesses that were, didn't feel democratic at all, and I've worked in traditional businesses that felt incredibly collaborative and democratic. So it's part of it is just culture, right? So that's something we, we really try to work on, and everyone think from hiring, so having people who are going to work with that person hire them, and having them totally focused on that teamwork and collaboration, and like how they answer those questions on how they like to work with people, all that kind of stuff. So creating that strong culture, and the reason why that's important is that we're creating a very professional place. Every like as a it started almost as a joke, but now literally everyone calls each other like sir and stuff like that. And it's very, very friendly. People are constantly joking and having fun. I don't want to make it sound like it. But it's like a very, very respectful place. But also very goofy, but regardless. So I think having a very professional atmosphere where people are treated with respect as a worker co-op, and even having like, I've had the opposite experience, like 76% of people knowing what a worker co-op is. Like I, I find like 80 to 5% of people have never heard of it. And so oftentimes people work here for months before they figure like, you were saying I can own the business? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you hold the class, like, I told 12 times, but it takes a while. Yeah. And then they're like, so, yeah, I'm like, yeah, then you will share in the night that get it takes a year to sink in sometimes. Yeah. So, we're not even profitable yet. And we had eight people buy in just like a month ago because they're excited. So, for me, that's really inspiring. And I think they, a lot of these people have been in this very abusive industry for 10, 20 years sometimes. And they can see themselves actually finding a home that's respectful and actually has equity and um, God willing someday benefits and so <laughs> that's sort of where I think we have an advantage is to just retaining and getting really strong people. Yeah I'd say for Equal Exchange it was really about walking the talk. We started supporting you know small farmers rather than plantation owned farms. Um, even in the organic industry it's really common for even if you are certified organic to for things to just be grown in a way where things are monocropped and it's you know really low wage labor. And so we really were committed to supporting small farmers who are organized into democratic cooperatives and that's they own their own land, it's equally their own business. And you know we're really providing a platform for support but we have no autonomy over what they do and it's they're they're owning it. 
And a lot of times we joke at Equal Exchange that they're actually way better at democracy than us. And so that's, that's probably true. So it was really us like, okay, if, if we're gonna have these expectations of the farmers we work with, like we ought to be organized that way as well. So I think that's made us stronger. I think that you know when you're out there and you're seeing all these labels and this is organic and this is you know grass fed or all these things and what does it all really mean? And so I think when you're standing on a shelf, you know, when we, people see Green Mountain and they see us, if they can't tell the difference, then, you know, we've failed and we really have to, like, educate consumers. So I think that even further to push the envelope is, like, actually, like, consumers need to be organized and they need to be connected with us and they need to be really paying attention to what brands I support. And it's not just, like, I go to a store and I buy, right? Like, we do campaigns with folks, um, you know, I've got a member in the audience who's come to support my talk, not to call you out, Sarah, but um, <laughs> I'm calling you out. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think that for us, it's it's about walking the talk, and people can tell when they come to Equal Exchange. And I don't know if this is also like a cultural thing too, but everybody that works at Exchange is really quirky in some way. So I don't know if that's also mm -hmm. connection to democracy as well. But yeah, I think it's walking the talk. Um. This is a question that I could really go on about, so just play the Oscar music if it's like time for that. <laughs> um, because our mission is so central to what we do, and the choice to convert was really connected to like solidifying and really preserving that mission. Um, so I'll really start this story like with our conversion and tell you a quick um, story of that process. Um, so. In 2012, uh, our two founders began meeting, actually probably it was 2011 when they started meeting with the three uh, employees who had <coughs> come together, the, like, the founding five worker owners. And um, that conversion process took a long time in terms of them laying the groundwork. And really, um, the, the vision of the founders was uh, like creating an alternate success story for a non <coughs> business. So often the pattern is get big enough to, to sell out. Yeah. And that's a really important thing that we share with Equal Exchange yeah. is that we're independently owned businesses. When I was talking about consolidation of power in the economy, there's there's maps online of the organic food system or the organic food industry, and this is true in conventional food as well, about just how few brands own all of these subsidiary brands. Um, and so you, it feels like you're looking at a lot of choice in the supermarket, and actually, you know, there's not that many companies. So finding a way to stay strong, independent brands uh, is really important for creating uh, like regionally resilient food systems, which is what we're all about. Um, and yeah, so what would it take for Real Pickles to remain strong as an independent business? And really the path was to become a worker co-op. Um, that means that the that our mission and our business is gonna outlast our founder. Like, you know, we're bringing on more people who are fired up about this mission. And sometimes I talk about worker co-ops as like hands in the mosh pit. Like it takes a lot of people to hold up a mission statement. Um, and uh, you know, that was our process. Uh, so we go through the process of converting and uh, you know, we, we went through a community financing campaign where basically we asked community investors to join us uh, through the, an investment mechanism called a direct public offering and basically asked them to help us finance the conversion. Um, we were not sure how this was gonna go. We were the first uh, worker co-op or we were the first business in Massachusetts to use this DPO mechanism to finance a co-op conversion. Um, you know, hopefully there will be many more to follow. Uh, and we raised, we, you know, like I said, we weren't sure how it was gonna go. We raised uh, $500,000 from 77 people in a couple months, which really tells me there's a hunger for people to uh, participate in change in the food system in many ways. Uh, investing is one way, organizing as consumers is one way. Probably lots of you have examples of how it's happening in your lives too. Um, so, that so one of the key bylaws that was created in that conversion process is that Real Pickles, if we ever decided to sell the business uh, to like a to a larger company, um, two things would happen. It would require a consensus vote of all the members, which would be really hard. That would be everybody deciding to uh, give up their job or give up some autonomy in their job. 
And also, all of the profits would go to a mission aligned charity. They would not go to individual uh, worker owners. So that's how strongly we feel about yeah. preserving our mission by staying an independent brand and being true to our mission as a co-op in that way. Um, and then I really second James's point about turnover. Um, we also have people who come to us after restaurant jobs where they have to um, like unlearn patterns of what it's like to work in abusive workplaces. Uh, we see that too, and we're like, you know, in some of those same questions about uh, creating that culture. Um, oh boy, there's so many more. The Oscar is my high place here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just want to okay, back on the no cello piece because yeah. we actually have the same clause written in our bylaws that if. Um, Basically, we wouldn't be able. We could sell out, right? But it would yeah. require that consensus vote. We wouldn't. There's no. They take you take the element of human greed out of it because the reality is, is there are a lot of folks who created some really groovy, cool companies, and they're all retiring now. And like that's like kind of the American dream, right? I have this really cool idea and this cool company. I'm going to you know sell it and like get a million dollars or something. Like Burt's Bees is owned by Clorox Bleach. Ben and Jerry's is owned by Unilever. Like this is the kind of world that we live in, and it's like this paradox where it seems like there's this independent front-facing brand, but it's actually really important to have those elements written into it. And there are a lot of folks, and it's awesome you could share that conversion story because lots of folks are getting older and selling your selling your business to your workers, right? Like that's another movement. And I think that's something that, you know, yeah. the conversion process, because we were kind of like from the beginning, like, you know, it was like rank, rank in, um, you know, the other two founders like sitting in a room. So it was like, okay, everything was cooperative, right? And they just had to write it on paper. But how, how do you like transition from like a conventional business to, like, to a worker co-op? Yeah, and we consult every year with businesses who are thinking about converting and who want to talk about the ins and outs, either for the founders or from the workers' side. So there's really a lot of interest in co-op conversions. And, uh, you know, it's going to take financing and also just businesses with deep relationships where the workers want to step into more responsibility to make it happen. Yeah, and I just want to point out, the Real Pickles conversion stories online. Mm -hmm. Diamond Courage, I've documented it. And Equal Exchange has done an amazing job putting bylaws, term sheets, and a lot of different things online. So other co-ops learn from that every every day. I talk to a lot of folks who use what you guys do. Yeah. Um, so I, I love, I just want to make sure we leave enough time for audience questions. So I, I love this notion um, that co-ops you know, allow long-term independent ownership. I love the notion that um, we're kind of locking in economic democracy. Uh, just one minute from each of you, and then we'll open up for the audience. Where has being a worker-owned co-op made it more difficult, just to get both sides of the picture, where is it either slowed things down or has been a little bit more painful? Um, I'll just say real quickly too, like we stole everything from them on that stuff. Like we have like conversion <laughs> stuff, we have the direct public offering. Um, so no, it's 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 also great when you don't have to, yeah, you know, but collaborate and learn from people who are doing yeah. it is like phenomenal. Um, yeah. So the question is, is uh, where, where has it been more difficult being a worker co-op? Capital. So getting enough, like, so our business to, to fully get started was $2 million. And we did the direct public offering and raised about $400,000 that way. Um, debt is a really tough way to start a business. We were able to get a good chunk, um, some from the city too, um, for workforce development. And then we also got a big chunk from some of the co-op lenders, uh, local enterprise assistance fund in particular. If you're looking for a lender, they're wow. phenomenal. I really, really, really recommend them. Um, and then, uh, but I mean, the truth is that we, me and Jason, my, my head brewer and partner, um, we like turned down a million dollars of capital on the way to getting started because it came with strings that we didn't want. Um, they were like, oh no, I'll work there too. I'll come in and check the books once a month. I'm like, no, I'm good. So <laughs> just like that kind of thing. And so, yeah, we had some, some interesting people try to play games with us because they could see that we were going to be successful. And then they try to weasel their way in, create divides between me and Jason or like, it was really, it was like, yeah, so at the end of the day, though, like we have a really interesting structure and we feel really good about it. So capital was the hardest part. Um, and uh, just making sure you get founded right, because that's going to, if you don't do it right, even though you're hungry, it's going to like pound you the rest of your you know, lives, basically, if you're not happy with how you start. So. Yeah, it's interesting, like people exchange has been around for a lot longer. And so it feels like the landscape in which we started was a bit easier to start a co-op. Now it feels like that startup is really difficult and capital and getting that capital. Um, so yeah, I, I feel for folks who are like trying to start up now and for like the work that you're doing. Um, so I think that's 
really important. So I think we have kind of different challenges. So some of our challenges is that as we grow and we're more geographically dispersed, how do you honor participation and connection to the different co-op members? And it's probably taken about like five to eight years for like the Zoom thing to feel really functional for anyone who's familiar with that. But now we have worker owner meetings on Zoom. We're like voting online. And so, you know, technology has been just a really like wonderful piece for us. We have a staff retreat every other year because we do believe that it's, Im it's important to like have that in-person connection with folks. And so, yeah, for us, it's like the, keeping that like participation connection um, as you grow. And then I think because we've been around for so long and like people are kind of like have this, I, you know, thought process of, hey, it's working, like let's just keep doing the same things that we're doing. But that challenging landscape that we all exist in and where it's really hard for, and it's really hard for independence right now to, to exist. Like that's, it, it's really hard. And so I think that that forces you to constantly be thinking about innovating and changing. And so as you grow with, with more people, um, people can be resistant to change, right? So, so sometimes people are afraid of change. So we find a lot of that, that there's like some folks who are kind of, you know, have been working at Equal Exchange for 25 years and they want to keep it the way that it is. And so it's, you know, you gotta, you got to keep changing, you got to take risks. And luckily we have funds to be able to do that. And we fail at a lot of things too and waste money sometimes, but it's, it's part of that learning process. So risk taking. Um. Well, the first challenge that comes to mind when I think about real pickles is climate change. And in some ways, that's a challenging problem we're facing at many levels. I don't think that being a worker co-op makes it more challenging, but I do think it's an interesting example of, you know, if part of being a co-op is you solve problems with the people who are in the room together, like bought into the business together, when all of us turn to each other and say, whoa, what are we gonna do about climate resiliency? How are we gonna help our farmers? Uh, what about our business? Uh, can we change in the spirit of mitigation or adaptation? That, that conversation feels really uh, important. And also, um, you know, we have one, one person who's part-time at Real Pickles and part-time as a climate scientist at UMass. And she's been helping lead these conversations. Um, but it's still an interesting example of like, wow, you turn to the people who are in the room with you and like, we, we might not have all the solutions we need here. Um, that, you know, climate change is gonna really change a lot of things in the food system. Uh, those impacts are already being felt, um, and we're we're really trying to face that challenge in the best ways that we can. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for making it real. Um, yeah, it, it is for all of us. Okay, so I promised you about 15, 20. We're gonna have about 14 minutes for questions. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll just try to give a head nod. Okay, great. First one. Okay, three things. Number one, God bless you all for having done this. I think worker-owned businesses are really the way things should be done. Number two, are all three of you, maybe all four of you, aware of what is, to my mind, the greatest collection of worker-owned businesses in the world, which is the Mondragon Cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain? You're shaking your heads, yes? <laughs> yes! Most people that I talk to haven't even heard of Mondragon. They have no idea what Co-op nerds, right here. <laughs> Wonderful! <laughs> and number three, number three, real fast. You were talking about the whole issue about democracy and consensus and all that sort of thing. I hope you are well aware that this is a very old problem that has been seen long before. The best reference so far that I am aware of on this, it's called Builders of the Dawn. The authors are Corinne McLaughlin and Gordon Davidson. It's essentially about intentional communities. A, what is an intentional community? B, what makes an intentional community work? And maybe most important of all, number three, what makes intentional communities fail? And if you're familiar with this subject, you know the failure rate is horrid. It's absolutely horrid. But one of the many gems in that book is this whole thing about decision making, where they talk about, yeah, you can have a dictator. On the other hand, you can try to do everything by consensus, and if you try to do that, you waste so much time and energy and effort just trying to make a decision, you haven't got anything left over to actually do anything. So there needs to be this middle ground between dictatorship and absolute consensus where you can actually get things done, and the Mondragon cooperatives are a wonderful example 
of how that gets done, and also what you were addressing about the whole idea of capital. Hopefully you've heard about the, the Caja Laboral Popular, the Working People's Bank of Mondragon, which is set up to solve exactly this problem and can be a very good example of how it proceeds. Thank you very much. So, Builders of the Dawn, Mondragon, happy to give people references on that later. Uh, Mondragon is really interesting because yes. one of the things, it's not just the structure, I think to James' point about culture, is they've created a culture where people are on the same page, it's not just the actual, how do we make decisions, but um, anyway, I want to make sure we get to a few more questions I saw. Yes? Um, so, sometimes I think the labels, like the, you know, the tree labels are kind of labels and things, because they're associated with higher price points. Can you speak up? Oh, can you speak oh, up a little bit? Yeah. So sometimes um, these books, um, when they talk about you know, their goals and things like that, they can be seen as exclusive because they're associated with a higher price point. So I'm wondering how you, I don't know, break through that with consumers and reach out to them in terms of your branding, um, in terms of reaching out to them um, with these bigger ideas of what a product or a brand should do um, when they have, they might feel, I don't know, Outside so mm. let me just repeat for the room. So she's asking about pricing. <coughs> Some of these brands have to charge higher prices to support their models, if I have it right. Mm -hmm. Danielle, from Equal Exchange, if you don't mind, answer next. I think you guys handle that really well. You could talk about I think it's, does I, the consumer pay more? Sorry, go ahead. I think it's really hard. I think we try to be price competitive and we really try to push volume for small farmers. And so how do you push volume is like you lower your price. So, you know, we are located in different places that maybe we don't like so much, like grocery retailers that actually, so there is kind of like that paradox and that double-edged sword, like, okay, like, does Equal Exchange sell in Walmart, right? Like, do, do we sell in Target? And it's like, if these are the places where folks are shopping and like, especially in rural communities where they might have to drive an hour and like the only place or the only option is a Walmart or a Costco and they can't have access to Equal Exchange products. So. We are intentionally in those places, and I mean, you know, we're selling our coffee in some places for seven ninety nine, and some people might say, okay, coffee is, you know, but I, I don't know, I come from a low income background, and like, I drank coffee, you know, like that was, we needed to stay awake, I guess, but you know, I think that it's a really hard question, and there's so much more work to be done there, but I think it's like being in places that maybe you don't like being as much, and I think being around for a longer time, and like having those channels, and there's a also the back end consolidation where there's um, UNFI that's basically owning most of the natural foods world and you know we, we have to be there or else we, we don't exist. So it is a really hard question. It's a really hard question. So, okay. Yeah, can I chime in a couple yep. things? Um, you know, <coughs> we absolutely feel this question because we're trying to give our farmers a fair price and pay a fair yeah. wage and it's true. Our products are too expensive for everyone to afford. Um, we're still, I think, pricing incredibly moderately for the quality of food that we're putting out there and for the way that profits are being shared throughout the whole business and really throughout the whole food system because of um, paying our farmers a fair price. So the, the things I would say about food access is like one worker co-op alone can't solve that. We need full change in the food system, including raising wages everywhere <laughs> in order to get to that. And we want to be a part of that solution and really be showing that there's a role that small businesses can play in like broader system change. Um, so I would shout out the Boston Ujima project in Boston as someone who's doing that, who's trying to do co-op development in low-income communities here and really get people to, uh, you know, because it, it shouldn't feel like you have to buy, you know, a $7 jar of sauerkraut to be living the values that we're talking about. Uh, that's, that's only one way to participate in the story. There's a lot of other ways. I wanted to say one more thing because they just like triggered me um, to say something. But there is also like, like she's saying that we can't all be experts in everything, and there's actually other organizations doing that really well. So maybe it's like we support those organizations. So we have um, you know tried to um, help a bit Rogers Park Food Co-op in um, Chicago is like a really interesting model where they're trying to also like incorporate culture and food, and so it's one of the most diverse um, populations like in the entire US and so really trying to consider that and what <coughs> products do I actually sell in my food cooperative as well and really trying to make things accessible so you know hey maybe it's we, we basically donated a ton of product and we're like fundraise like just keep all the profits from from that so it's it's like yeah there's other folks who are doing that work and so as much as we can we also try to support folks who maybe do that better than we can 
we just do one thing, which is, well, we do a bunch of stuff, but the biggest thing I would just say is like our public house model, we're trying to be really inclusive. We do like a $5 worker's pint. So it's called a worker's pint, it's five bucks. Mm -hmm. Just like, kind of place that's accessible to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if we can get to two, you know, one or two more questions. Uh, anyone's got, got a burning question? Yeah. Um, I love that 76% of people are, would say, would want to support. And so I wondered, um, in terms of your messaging, either on your packaging or on your website, how are you um, informing people of that? Because I know I certainly, when I see it on the top of a peanut butter thing that it's worker owned, I like, I grab that over another one. You know, are you doing it on your packaging? How are you doing it? We use the double tree seal. Um, it's uh, on the, it's like by the barcode on our jar. And we talk about our mission statement on the jar and the fact that we're a worker co-op. Oh, nice. Yeah. Not, you know, there is a difference between employee-owned and worker co-op. <coughs> that's for another panel. Yeah. yeah. That's what we do. I want to chime in this, but I want to see if I do want to. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a growing acceptance that the word co-op is a positive. Um, maybe it's just current economic things going on. But I point out two examples that didn't exist five years ago. So REI, which is a consumer-owned co-op, not worker-owned, but still a good model. Um, they now have a, a brand in their store called Co-op, so you can buy a bike that has the brand Co-op right on it. They're embracing that. Another example is Cabot Cheese, who most of you, I'm sure, know. Um, they just rolled out a huge rebranding, and if you look at their packaging, as of like three weeks ago, it now says uh, Farmer-owned Co-op on the front. So it was super small and hidden on the back, and they realized, like, hey, there's this asset that we don't have to hide anymore. But it is sort of an ongoing debate in the Co-op community. I mean. Just to give you one more counter example, credit unions are consumer-owned banks. And we may not think of them as co-ops, but they are. Uh, but they sort of use the word credit union because they're like, most people don't get what it is. It goes back to that only 10% of people really can explain it. So you know, I think one of the reasons we're all of us try to get out there and talk about it is we want people to understand it because when people understand it, usually they support it more. But we don't even usually call it a work co-op. Uh, we usually call it a democratic business. Um, part of that is because I think a lot of people associate co-ops with sort of upper class white folks who can sort of escape the economy and go do something nice by themselves. Um, and it sounds crunchy a little bit. And so we are kind of, well, the reason we call it a democratic business too, to be honest, is because we've had people be excited about us who are like from New Gages <laughs> magazine and write about us from a super right wing perspective, where we're passing on profit motive to all workers. Right, so on a free market basis, and then we've had you know Democratic Socialists of America try to do everything they can at a place, right? So it's a bizarre mix of people yeah. who can be excited by the model. I mean, Ronald Reagan went on and on about worker ownership being a great idea. So I think democratic business for us is important just because it's like in America, just the ideology is like you have a problem with business or democracy, and it's a very easy way to be like it's the most American thing because apple pie and all that. Yeah, it's a surprising red state and blue state thing. I mean, there are co-ops in the middle of the country, all the agricultural co-ops are sort of a red state uh, initiative. You talk about all the outsourcing, you say, would you have voted to send your job to China? You know what I mean? Like, it's a pretty, like, left-wing, right-wing, I think there's a lot of common ground. Uh, we got room for one last question, and if not, we'll, we'll wrap there. Any last? I was very brewery specific, though. I wanted to ask about the, uh, the Brewers Association, the Independent Brewers Association, mm -hmm. and talking about the labeling, with their labeling, if you thought that fit in well with where you wanted to go with the, with your business? So that's a great question. Um, the question is is that the Brewers Association has an independent label that they're trying to really push because of the same thing as you guys are facing. Yeah. Everybody's getting bought up by massive mm -hmm. companies. They don't tell you. And so you're like, oh, yeah, they're from so-and-so. And they might still be in New Hampshire, but they're actually owned by, like, South Africans who have tons of money and own, you know, so whatever. So the label itself we're not even doing distribution yet, but already we're hearing blowback where it's not working. And like everybody's yeah. being able to use it. And so it's like the same thing as craft beer became anything basically. And then I, I work in a brewery, oh, right. an independent brewery, and we don't use the label. Why don't you use the And I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not in a, in a position where I get to make those sort of decisions sure. in my business, but I think it comes from this similar place where they don't see the, they don't see the sort of people, people don't recognize it, people don't, don't engage with it in the way that they would like. So there's a hurdle to getting that label onto the bottles that they don't think is worthwhile, you know, getting past that hurdle to get involved in that. Yeah. We're working on the worker own because I think people get really excited about that. Yeah. And there's all the breweries that are doing that, like Bell's Brewing and other things like that too. And not Bell's Brewing, help me out. 
um, big guys in Colorado. Oh, um, New Belgium. New Belgium, they're awesome. So yeah, there's some bigger firms, even Harpoon now is like majority worker owned. So there's like some of the larger firms are even going that way, which is helpful too. So. Mm -hmm.